got a, an amazing presentation and I, I don't know how many of you uh, have heard of Hatch Show Print or Selene Aubrey or hopefully maybe Nashville. And, uh, and so, but this is gonna be a treat for you all today and learning something about um, uh, Hatch Show Print and, and the work and the love that Selene Audrey puts in to what she does on our broadcast. And so uh, Selene Audrey is the director and she's the shop manager at Hatch Show Print, which is iconic. It's legendary letterpress print shop. Uh, I think it's been operating since the late 1800s uh, in Nashville and um, Tennessee. And um, it is inside of the uh, Country Music Hall of Fame. And, um, and it thrives as a letterpress uh, poster and design shop. Um, it has a visiting artist program. It has until pandemic times had an internship program, which is amazing. And we've had students in the past uh, attended. It has a gallery showcasing Pinterest art and, and, and they do hands-on tours, which are amazing. So you're gonna to get to see inside of some of that and, and hear about it a little bit today. And they do workshops uh, from the education space. It is amazing. This is, um, uh, the, you have seen their work all over the world in, I mean, I think one of the first guys to ever stop by the, you know, stop by the shop was Elvis Presley and, and every musician since Elvis has stopped by this shop and, uh, and had posters done, music posters of every music genre. And um, um, you've seen the NFL uh, take on campaigns that have been created by then. You have seen CNN uh, uh, take on campaigns created by them. You've seen national political campaigns come out of their shop. So you don't know all this, but you're getting ready to have a treat. And so, um, Selene, uh, can I turn it over to you? She's over there. Yeah, there she is. Sorry, is it my turn to talk now? I can hear you. Okay, great. I can Sorry, everybody. We're, I'm live in the shop. Um, and I just want to say that one of the fun things of... Hi. One of the fun things of pandemic and these crazy Zoom things is that I get an opportunity to actually bring you guys into the shop as we're working. And so there's a really a lot of noise happening right now because Lauren is printing the first color of a poster on press and she's using one of our largest presses and it's really, really noisy. So I'm gonna start with some visuals. I'm gonna turn the laptop around so you guys can see what she's doing because I wanna sort of show you guys what our process is and then share a bit of a slideshow with you. Ah, oh, there I am. And um, we'll take it from there. Anyway, so this is by the side of my pants. I hope you can hear me and I'll be repeating lots of this stuff, but at Hatch Show Print, it's all letterpress all the time, and that literally means hand-set wood and metal type, assembled and hand inked. And so I have some type for a poster that's going to go on press after we get off this call. I'm going to show it to you. It's all backwards. So. That's going to go in this press bed. And I've already mixed my ink for it. Can you see that? Yep, you can. So that's where it starts. We start with the handset type. And once it's ready to print, like what Lauren's doing on this big press, she's checking the registration on her paper. She's just printing a, a brown border for her for prints. She'll print the other two colors in the next couple of days. And then Heather is in mid process 
on the final color of a print. So you can see the type that I showed you before will get locked into the press bed like this. We hand mix all of our ink. So it's all done by hand and to match Pantones and um, whatever colors we think will look good in great combinations. But she has just spent about an hour making sure that every single letter and those guitars, maybe you can see those next to Carly Pierce's name in the middle of the poster there. All of them are the same height, which is type high. Letterpress printing literally means letters pressed into paper with ink in between. And everything that we make here at Hat Show Print is letterpress printed by us here in the shop. Here's the final poster. So you can sort of see on its side. And then there's her ink. I'm sorry if I make anybody a little seasick, <laughs> but I'll go to the back of the shop now um, and then sort of give you a, show you a slideshow. But as I walk back, you can see there's Jennifer working on a poster. <laughs> um, we try to take, give ourselves with client interaction, we try to give ourselves two to three weeks of design time. Um, sometimes that doesn't work that way. We are a bit pressed with some of our show posters. In pandemic times, our friends at, for instance, the Ryman Auditorium here in Nashville have really um, booked themselves solid. And so they're giving us their poster orders as fast as they book the artist to play the stage. And sometimes that leaves us with about two weeks to design and print a poster or um, sometimes five days. Uh, which can get a little hairy with client interaction if you guys have ever done any internships. I'm gonna flip now to slideshow. That'll show you more of the shop. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes, good, okay. <laughs> we, have, we have some techn technical difficulties earlier, which were wholly my part, or my responsibility. So anyway, um, welcome to Hat Show Print. Thank you for coming. Thank you for putting up with our ambient, no ambient noises here in the shop. That is us going through the course of a work day here in the shop. We have currently six of us designing and printing posters. Um, we have one person trying to keep us as organized as is humanly possible and it's almost too much for one person to do. And then we have four or five folks who are educating and so they're giving tours, they're talking to schools and we're talking to school age kids from first grade all the way through the college level. Um, some people come here for tours and then some people like what we're doing now um, is a virtual lecture or visiting lecture or something like that. Sorry, I'm just moving again to try to get away from that noise a little bit. Um, but I'll run through this, some of these slides. So this is our shop here on Representative John Lewis Way in Nashville, Tennessee. We are in the same building as our sister organization or parent organization, uh, the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. And for the most part, the way folks see us here in the shop is through these gates that in, um, exit or enter through the retail store, the stock, uh, retail store. This is what our space looked like that I just sort of walked around and showed you when it was empty. Um, it looks really big, but by the time we got all the presses and the type and the composing tables and all of that in here, it's, it's, you know, a little bit of a, um, it's all filled up nearly. And this is from 2013 when we moved into this shop. And there's the view from the back of the shop where I'm sitting now. Um, and you can see all of the type, those cabinets to the left hold wood type. Um, the cabinets to the right mainly hold metal type. And then if you see on the far right on the wall, those, that, black and dark brown stuff, that's all wood type that's bigger, that's over three inches tall, shall we say. 
Um, our wood type goes in ranges in size from about two thirds of an inch to 160 inches. Um, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll show you some of that as we go through this. Um, that's what you can see. We have 80 feet of glass along the hallway outside the shops. And we are in the middle of a city block size building that contains the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum, us, some restaurants and other gift shops and things like that, and the Omni Hotel down at the other end. So if you're walking from the Omni Hotel uh, down the hallway, this is what you see. And for any of you guys who might know Jim Shradden, that is him working at one of our big air presses in the shop. We have a gallery that's right along Representative John Lewis Way, right on the street. It's full of natural light because it's got a wall of windows and it's gorgeous. Um, and we have, as Hank said, we have um, visiting artists such as, this is David Wolski, uh, the results of his um, time here as a visiting artist. And we host shows in there in the normal times and we've got art in there hanging all the time. And fortunately we've built up a nice collection of work from our visiting artists that people can come in and see. And we make re-strikes or reprints of our large blocks, some of which you'll see in the future. Uh, what we do is make posters. So these are, this is an array of posters and you can sort of see the range of styles and colors and type that we use. And all of this is done by us here in the shop. We only design what we, we only print what we design and we design everything we print. So if somebody comes to us with a design that's already been dreamed up by their design team, we will re make recommendations for great letterpress print shops if that's what they're after. Um, but we can't print that here because everything that we make is built by hand using individual wood letters, metal letters, and hand carved blocks uh, made of wood, linoleum, and some metal image plates. Um, and if you look at this, for instance, that poster that's in the middle um, that looks like that a building that's uh, going to take off or something like that with the red stripes behind it. That is actually hand carved specifically for the Goo Goo Dolls. That's a building in Buffalo, New York, which is where they're from. And so we carved that just for them for that tour. And that carries through the aesthetic of the handmade and the, the hand carved and the hand built features that we have in all of our work. And that can't really be replicated if we try to take someone else's design and wrench it into our process, if you will. There's some of the old wood type. As you can see up close, all of the spacing, letter and line is done by hand and eyeball. Um, and you can't really squish two letters together. Like you can see that at up there above old is, is going to be printed the way it's going to be printed because um, there's no tightening of that stuff unless the letters are cut, which happens. This is our part of our wall and I can walk around the shop in a bit and show you this again live. It's a hot mess right now because you know we're making posters. We're actually not super focused on being really organized and tidy. Um, but this is a wall that has a bunch of hand carved imagery. So all of these blocks range in age from the first decades of the shop open opening in 1879 uh, to last week, uh, something being carved. And it's today, most of us carve in linoleum, but some of us do still carve in wood. In addition to posters, we do other forms of design work. Um, these are, this is a book project that was done with the publisher Tashin in 2013 and it's um, we did some of the book design work to accompany a collection of photographs of Elvis Presley taken in 1956 and so while everybody on staff focuses on the physical design and the letterpress printing we also have complete access and the skill set to use all of the Adobe Creative Suite tools to take what we do by hand here in the shop and transport it into the digital realm to provide it to 
our clients who want to use it for something else, such as a books, magazines, packaging, um, clothing, that kind of stuff. I think I might have a picture later on of some, some stuff we did with Draper James uh, recently. Anyway, I'll keep going. Postage stamps. Um, that's, we did the typography. We were um, fortunate to work with Gail Anderson. Also, I think 2012, 2013 to do the typography for a postage stamp that she had devised for the US Postal Service. And we did some printed some posters for the US Postal Service as well. So that's the R is life size. And then the postage stamp you see is postage stamp size. So kind of cool. But I'm going to go back a little bit and then trace a couple of trace through the, uh, the history of the shop and sort of focus on a couple of things that um, showed how our, you know, our ability to be flexible with our process, even though it's ridiculously old and it seems very antiquated. We've still been in business for 142 years. We've never not been in business. We've never not been making posters. And it just took a few adjustments to the technology as it changed in advance. Um, but this is Nashville in 1875, dirt roads, as you can see. This is the year that um, Charles and Herbert Hatch moved to Nashville with their parents and their father, William H. Hatch, had been a preacher and a printer in Prescott, Wisconsin. And his two sons grew up apprenticing in various aspects of the printing and publishing businesses. And then in 1875, they moved to Nashville. One, a couple of things to keep in mind. In 1875, there was no electricity. The light bulb wouldn't be patented until four years later. Einstein wasn't born until 1879. Neither was Will Rogers, if that means anything to any of you guys, I should say. And this is eight years before the phonograph was patented or trademarked. So um, just to give you an idea of the time period in which this shop opened. Um, Nashville, this is um, downtown Nashville. The Cumberland River runs right through downtown Nashville. And this is the, the banks of the Cumberland River uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It was a shipping channel. Goods would come in and things like paper and ink and stuff like that and other goods. And they would go to the businesses in Nashville. Nashville at that point in time was one of the top five printing cities in the United States because all of the American churches had their printing and publishing houses here in Nashville. So many Bibles, hymnals, and other religious tracts were actually published and printed here in Nashville in the early 20th century. Um, these, and that's uh, 1879 is the year Charles and Herbert, who you see on the lower right, uh, opened the shop. And these are a couple uh, or a few classified ads um, that talk about their business. And one thing I thought was interesting about the top ad in the Nashville American was, um, in addition to printing and posters, apparently they worked as an agency for helping the traveling shows and entertainments, circuses and carnivals and things like that, uh, recruit new performers. Not sure how that worked, but um, here's another one that piece in the upper right corner, according to Will T. Hatch, Charles's son, is the first piece that was printed by the shop. Um, it's for a lecture by the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher here in Nashville on April 12th, 1879. And so that's what we celebrate as the shop's anniversary every year. Our telephone number hasn't changed either, by the way. Um, this is Nashville in 1895. And all of those black lines you see are electricity lines going back and forth because by that time electricity was crisscrossing the city um, and it was the hot wave. What was Hatch printing in 1879, 1880s, early 1900s? Well, this is the inside of the 
Ryman Auditorium, what we call the Ryman Auditorium nowadays. When it opened in 1892, it was really a church that held religious service 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, it's a founder, builder, uh, namesake Thomas Ryman was proselytized in one um, tent revival meeting. And so he wanted to build something to um, honor his newfound faith and provide a place for people to gather. And this happens to be a temperance meeting in 1895. And you can see on the walls of the Ryman there, the letter B on the left next to the, on the left side of the door, the letter C, and then over to the right, the C and the D. Well, those came from us. Those were cut here in the shop in the first six or so years that the shop was open. And so we were printing those and providing those to the Ryman Auditorium so they could help define their seating sections. Um, that's one of the things that we were printing, just one of the many things. Um, that wasn't our largest type. This is our 160 inch type. So that's what we call two sheet type. At that point in time, the largest sheet size commercially made paper in sheets not on rolls and sheets was about 30 by 40 inches. And so for that reason, all of our printing presses and all of our printing blocks were designed to print on that size paper. So that E is two blocks that are 40 inches tall and then you print both of them and then you can paste those two pieces of paper up just the way they're laid on the floor there in the print shop and then you have an E for your billboard. And we're talking billboards were all no, no vinyl, no LED, no digital, no none, none of that high highfalutin stuff we have these days. Um, although I hear in Atlanta, you guys still have a billboard company that does paper billboards. Um, most of them today are vinyl, but back then all of them were paper unless they were hand painted. And so they were devised by sheets. And when the customers would come to Charles and Herbert Hatch and the staff, they'd ask them how many sheets are your billboard. And by that, they could determine how much room they needed, what they could print, how many letters they could have, and things like that. And so um, sheet size is very much part of the parlance of that era of the shop. This is some of the remaining imagery that we have from that era. This baseball player was carved in 1887. And you can see he's got, let's see if there's a bigger print. Yeah, the very, the, you know, classic, what we all recognize as pre-commercial photography, cross hatching to define shading and dimension and things like that. And he, was a, what we call a five color, three sheet, five color baseball player, which meant it took five colors to make the complete print. And because there's three sets of blocks, that's 15 blocks in total. Um, as you can see, they didn't all make it to the 21st century. Um, some of them have gotten chewed up, but we did in, at the end of 2019, we did recarve our baseball player. So we have now a full full color full fully height um baseball player which i don't have a picture of in here but um it's on our website in our online shop i think so this is a i should say that and you'll i'll probably say this later but a lot of the imagery of that era was hand carved in wood. That's this is wood. It was obviously stained from many uses of ink, many layers. Um, hand carved in the shop. You can see from the the marks in the areas that are not green. That's carved away actually, um, even though it looks kind of like it would print. But the second generation really didn't have an interest, I guess, in keeping a lot of the stuff that his dad and his uncle had made. And so, or they just recycled and reused it. Um, and so this is what we have 
representative of that era. We do also have a bunch of blocks that have a lot of the hand lettering that they did. So this was all, this is also carved by hand. I don't know if I, yeah, I didn't put the wood block in, but the wood block is exactly like this, but obviously backwards because with letterpress printing, you print and what the print comes out as is a mirror of what you've um, got locked up in your press bed. And this is all hand carved and hand lettered. We have a lot of examples of this style of hand lettering from the early decades of the print shop. In addition to the hand lettering that they would do for their clients, we have all that, that beautiful huge wood type. And then, as I said, type ranging in size from that size down to two thirds of an inch and smaller for the metal type. And they would use that to set something. For instance, if Molly Bailey was coming through Tennessee, she was a based out of Texas. There's, these shows were based out of Texas. But if she was coming through Tennessee, on a next next sheet of paper, they could list the dates and the towns that they she might be stopping in in Texas, and if there were ticket prices or anything interesting that she wanted to call out. That's where they would use the handset type to set that variable information. And those we could get pasted up side by side in a downtown, um, on a billboard, if there's a billboard that she's taken out that's big enough, um, that sort of thing. This is the Hatch family. And in 1921, when his father passed away, Will T, who's the third from the left holding, the, holding his child, his son, um, took over the shop. Um, he built this print shop on 4th Avenue in downtown Nashville, right across the street from the Ryman Auditorium. And this is one of his early advertisements, newspaper advertisements, advertising his new shop, a kind of a new business. Note that it was CR and HH Hatch, named after Charles and Herbert. And he was trans started to transition it to Hat Show Prints, the name that we're known for today. And you can see down there specialty printers producing posters, posters, dates, muslin banners, window cards, tech cards, heralds. And so we printed back then, not only did we print on paper, but we also did print on cotton muslin, which would have um, lasted a, quite a bit longer. Um, this is the inside of that shop, probably taken in the mid 80s, early to mid 80s. And you, as you recall, that's all that stuff exists in the shop here today. We still work with all of it. Um, so when Will T took over and a lot of the blocks and a lot of the imagery that you'll see going forward is from his era of running the shop. He grew up in the shop, learned the trade from his father and his uncle and really, understood the value of relief printing and printmaking in terms of the just the wall-to-wall -wall color that it offers the simplicity of the art um, that graphically really grabs your eye and um, stands out when you're you know rumbling down a dirt road in your ford model a or ford model t at the turn of in the early 20th century you don't you need to have bright and bold and easily legible or if you're driving riding in a wagon or walking these things were meant to posters were meant to catch your eyes grab your attention give you the information and hopefully um, give you an idea of where you were going to be spending your saturday afternoon or saturday evening so to go from his style of from you know to sort of get into the style of advertising art that a print shop like Hat Show Print could make, he would take inspiration from anywhere and everywhere he found it. And so it started off with this beautiful, which didn't translate in the screenshot, but this beautiful engraving of, of George Washington that he then simplified into some line art in the second image still kind of uh, a little bit delicate, a little bit uh, fussy, a little bit um, too detailed. So on the right, you can sort of see the final with the shading that will make sense for cutting it into wood. 
And then he would create a tracing of that on the left there, transfer that tracing to the first block to make the key block, which in this case would have been the red, and then transfer that image to another block to then carve out, carve away all of the wood to make the blue. And you can see that sort of intense, vibrant line where the red and the blue meet, and that's the trapping. So that's where those colors overlap to make sure that there's always that there's that there's never, you know, you don't see the white of the paper through the through the print. So to start from that tiny little beautiful engraving on the left and go to that is is how we have to think most of the time in our process here of making at Hat Show Print. Here you can see the posters in action. So this is um, a photograph taken by Marion Post Wolcott, who's working for, for the Farm Securities Administration in 1939 during the Depression. She toured, did, went on all sorts of assignments to, to capture what people were doing, people's lives in their towns. And this is, these are examples of the types of advertising that Hat Show Print was creating, because this is work that we've made. And that's all printed from large wood blocks that we still have here in the shop. And then the things you can see like here on the right where it says Wednesday with the AY cut off um, and all of that, that's, those are extra blocks. And that four is a piece of wood type that we have here in the shop. So again, they would have this great artwork that they've devised for their customers. And Silas Green was a customer for, I'm going to say at least 60 or 70 years. Um, they'd have that beautiful artwork and then they could complement it with the specifics of each town, the dates, the times, the ticket prices. Here's another example. So Wednesday, October 4th. Um, and then those things, and these would get these, the, they're colorful. Like these are actually printed in orange and green. And we, the shop would print thousands of them and then print the supporting specific dates and times for each town, you know, as the traveling show ordered them from the shop. And Silas Green often sent telegraphs back to the shop saying we need more of this, can you print it with these this information and you know send it on to this town and our advance men will pick them up and then paper the towns. And that's the side of the grocery store um, and they just get pasted up. And once the, the traveling show came through town, pitched their tents to perform their shows and needed to pack up and move on, those would get pasted over with whatever live entertainment was coming through town the next time. You have to get, this is, a, you know, the 1930s, post-depression. Um, electricity exists, but it hasn't necessarily made it all the way out to the rural areas. So, and folks don't necessarily have radios. Television doesn't exist. Movies are on the rise, but they're still not, you know, quite as uh, uh, prevalent as they are today and particularly without digital access that we have today. And so most entertainment was live and in person and that kept the shop very busy, very colorful as you can see. Um, here's just another example of photograph photographs being uh, translated into wood blocks for printing for the 1932 election. And we still have those blocks. You see Mr. Hoover has lost the top of his head. That's because after the election, he lost. Um, it's unlikely that he was gonna run again and certainly weren't gonna hear from him for at least four years. And so that wood was perfectly good to either cut up and carve on the backside for something else real quick or more likely in this case, turned into a shelf. So um, here's an example of what we were doing uh, for the Grand Ole Opry advertising, that's the Ryman Auditorium, the outside of the Ryman Auditorium. And as the depression was slowly, was releasing its hold on the country, 
the rise of country music was coming into view. Um, by the time WSM radio, 650 AM on your dial, was reaching 30 states across the nation with its weekly radio show called the Grand Ole Opry, where all of these soon to be and somewhat famous country music artists were performing. Um, Hatch had already been in business for almost 60 years. And that was 1925. Post uh, depression, these artists started touring. They started going out and visiting these folks in these cities. All of, of these folks in the, across the country, again, in 30 states, this radio station was the second clear channel station in the country. And it was able to reach the population of the country in 30 states across the country. So everybody is listening to the same music at nearly the same time. And that's probably one of the things that contributed to the popularity of country music. They came to Hatch to advertise those shows when they started touring. And so we were the shop that put the faces on the posters. And so here you can see Roy Acuff and you can see in the background his, one of his, we did many for Roy Acuff because he was enduringly popular. Um, his image as, given the uh, Will T. Hatch treatment for uh, block printing here in the shop. In addition to country music, movies were becoming very popular. That's a poster for um, a Western. Also, you know, late 30s, early 40s was a massively popular time for Westerns, um, among other movies. But that's a poster the shop made. And then the rise of the automobile and leisure travel, both a little bit pre, but mainly post World War II. Um, free silverware with your gasoline was one of many advertisements that we designed and printed for filling stations or service stations. Clean restrooms was definitely one of them. So these things, these posters were telling you something, oftentimes, most of the time, trying to sell you something. We have clean restrooms. You can stop here. It'll be safe. Um, and you have clean restrooms and get your gas. Um, one, of the early, one of the first changes that happened is after World War II, we were making all of these great, these are all coming from hand carved wood blocks of wood. Um, the free silverware gasoline is, is 40 inches wide and 26 inches high. So that's, as you can imagine, um, that's a lot of work to lay that out and hand carve it and get it ready. I mean, they got very fast because this is what they did all day, every day. But after World War II, when all of the soldiers came home and all of our efforts at supporting the soldiers fighting overseas um, could be redirected to rebuilding the country once again and refocusing our efforts, uh, technology made an advancement. So photo plates as something that became consistently um, good enough quality to print on posters and also technologically were cutting edge. I mean, Dolly Parton wants to see her image. Porter Wagner wanted to see his image. They don't necessarily want to see their faces simplified into two or three colors. They want the full effect of a photograph on the poster. So we started printing more photographs on posters. Post-World War II, as technology moves away from having to be focused on, you know, making tanks or making, you know, weaponry or things that help support the, the troops fighting overseas, they can refocus uh, on other things like television, microwaves, things like that. So life was speeding up for everybody. Leisure time was becoming um, much more accessible and approachable to many, many people. And there were more people out there entertaining. In 1956, we had this little kid, this kid from Tupelo, Mississippi, who went up to New York City and appeared on a few live um, TV programs and was heard on the radio and burst on the scene. And for many people in America, that's when rock and roll was born. So not only do you have 
these variety tent shows like Silas Green, um, tent revival meetings like what Samuel, uh, what Captain Ryman went to in the 1890s, which are still happening. You also have country music and then you have rock and roll on it and then you have television and then you have movies. Um, all of this meant more options and what it meant for a place like Hatch was more work. More folks were out on the road and they needed their posters faster because they needed more. They weren't playing these large tent shows that may set up for two weeks in a town. They were doing, you know, two to three shows in a town in one or two days and then moving on to the next town or city. And so our that's when our posters went from being the 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 26 by 40 inch minimum size to 22 by 28 inches or more often 14 by 22 inches, what we call a window card here at Hatch. And so the photo plates helped because that sped up the process of recreating an artist's image on a poster on an advertisement. We could get a photo plate made. We had two engravers as they were called within um, a baseball throws of the shop. We could go to the front doors of the print shop and see them. They were right across the street. They could make our, our plates for us. We hand set the type quickly you can see it's pretty straightforward. The great thing about posters is that when they're telling you or selling you something, they want it to be easy to read. So it's sans serif Gothic type with a little bit of antique thrown in. Um, for flair, we keep this color simple, red and blue, yellow and black, and then we can get more posters done. So the shop was able to adjust to this change in um, what people wanted to do, what people were interested in doing and the technology of the times. Um, here you can see the some of the variety of entertainment that's happening. Some folks um, might call both of these uh, petting zoos of a sort. Um, with Jane Mansfield and Llamas, which again you can see both have photo plates and classic poster colors, yellow, red, and black. They grab your eyes. The shop was doing so much work for the posters and doing so busy that they started to streamline some of the small ephemera that they used to do, hand bills and that sort of things. And they brought in a small offset press that they put in the basement of the shop. And they had a press operator who would work down there and he would take the posters and turn them into hand bills that could be handed out. And so here you have an example of some offset art in the lower right, that's Dolly Parton. And then um, a poster of a handbill that was shrunk down. We, they, most of the time they printed in one color, but this one they happened to do two colors. Um, and that was something that happened, I think starting in the, I wanna say the maybe the late forties, but probably the fifties and went, in, went for a number of years. Um, this is just a great poster of something that the shop was doing throughout wrestling, boxing and wrestling posters were, you know, kept the shop busy for many years because that is quintessential Southern entertainment. This is Nashville in about, I'm gonna say the early seventies. And this is the, the printer that would be working in, in a shop in Nashville in the early seventies. If I go back up here, um, Hatch is sort of not at this light, but at the next light up, up the street to your left, which you can see downtown Nashville um, is kind of colorful. It's got all sorts of entertainment. You can see there's a version, that's a version of a sign that right there in the middle with the guitar, that's where Robert's Rest Western Wear is. That's one of our honky tonks today down here in Nashville, but there were adult theaters and furniture stores and things like that. So. Nashville, downtown Nashville, just like any mid-sized American city in the mid 20th century was changing. This is the printer, he's functional. He's making those, you know, posters uh, like that Marty Robbins poster you see in the lower right corner where it's photo plate and simply set, fully justified left to right, top to bottom, classic mid 20th century show poster. Um, behind him, you can see the history of the shop in the hand carved blocks, but he 
you know, isn't necessarily doing that anymore. He's focused on the uh, posters on the right. And this is mid to late 70s, early 80s. Live entertainment is changing. Most folks are um, staying home watching the television, listening to the radio, possibly going to movies. Um, and it's, again, the perfect time for a transition here at Hat Show Print. And that transition happened for uh, this shop in 1984 when Jim Sheradden came to town and came here to write lyrics and studied printmaking at Middle Tennessee State University. And one of his teachers showed him this great old print shop in Nashville. And he knew that while he was working on his songwriting and recording music, he also wanted to work in this shop and was a history buff. And uh, he brought to the shop, the reverence for the history and the fascination with how these posters were made and the wall-to-wall -wall color and wanting to revive that because all of the tools still existed. The presses still exist. The staff, Kenneth Henson, who is this, this person, this printer here, was here. He's a, he's a master at what he does. He does it really well. And with just the injection of the imagination of someone who doesn't approach it, the process as, um, you know, a workaday printer, he's able to launch the shop on its next chapter, iteration, evolution. Um, you can see this is this is what uh, they started printing. They were printing in that era. These are from the early 80s. Um, the shop was still in business. I think it's hilarious because we had customers for so many years. It's an, it, it's unless you are have a family tradition or growing up, you've been going to the same place for as many years as you've been alive and your mom or dad or you know, grown ups around you have went to that place their whole lives too. It's hard to understand that a place that's been in business for over a hundred years and has worked with so many people in a place like Nashville, where music and touring, live entertainment is part of the industry of the city, if you will. It's hard to understand how ingrained in so many different businesses processes and ways of doing things, a place like this can be. And so the, the fact that we're on the left there advertising what is literally, this is closed circuit TV is literally the first uh, iteration of satellite television. And they're not advertising this on a television advertisement. They're advertising this satellite television with a show poster. I mean, just, sort of let that sink in, it's fascinating. Um, but that's because these folks, this is, they know that people are gonna see these posters if they're tacked up to telephone poles and they're driving around town, they know that that's how the posters are gonna get seen by a broad range of people. Um, the poster on the right, when Garth Brooks was breaking out and becoming the insane crossover hit that he was in the early 80s, these posters were ordered by True Value Hardware who sponsored his American tour to make these posters. And so it's, we're just, you can see at the bottom, you know, you order your tickets charging by phone or you listen to the radio show for details. It's hilarious that a ridiculously old, over 100 year old letterpress poster shop is making these posters in this era, but it's due to Jim knowing that these are great eye-catching things and injecting some of the color, looking at some of the type in the shop that hasn't been used in a while, like that gorgeous type that's being used for Garth Brooks and Riders in the Sky and Minnie Pearl, and making the posters eye-catching in a different way, in a way that becomes to be more reflective of the late 20th century, early 21st century. Um, another thing he did that kind of 
coincides with this era is establishes this notion that again we can design and print anything here in the shop on paper um, but not all of our customers need that they might need something different in this situ in this instance all of this artwork that you see was created by Jim for MCA Records, who were releasing a 15 CDs of country music in 1991, I think, 1990, 1991, at the advent of the compact disc. So music, the way music is being sold is transitioning from these big 12 inch vinyl records to these very sleek plastic CDs, what we thought of as sleek at the time. You know, I'm sure you guys are all laughing now because a CD is just like a, an extra thing you have to have around since all of our music is digital these days. Um, but MCA Records wanted a way to celebrate that they were pulling this stuff that would not has not been impressed in vinyl in decades. It was kind of, you know, maybe B-list stuff or back catalog stuff. And the advent of a CD made it so inexpensive for them to re-release music and get this music into the ears of new audiences. Um, they wanted to, you know, celebrate that with a bang. So they came to Hatch initially to design some some of these standard, more of these standard posters like this, but Jim convinced them that he could revive some of that style of the early 20th century with Will T. Hatch, the hand carved imagery and taking a photograph and making it more of a stylized representation of the artist. And, and he carved red Foley there on the upper right he carved and printed that in 24 hours to have it to show to the folks at MCA Records. And they loved it so much that they went on and asked him to do all 15 artists. And later, Emmy Lou Harris asked him to do the same thing for her Grammy winning album um, that she recorded at the Ryman, which during this time period was not open. Um, and then you can see on the right there, some more of the CD and album artwork that Jim and the staff, some of the staff in the shop worked on and created at the in the dawn of the digital era of the compact disc. I know you guys are all laughing. That's okay. Um, so this is 1992 or so. This is Hatch. Uh, the shop is literally right around the corner from that adult news uh, store. You can see it looks a little, quite a bit more rundown than it was in 1974. That adult world sign is the same one you saw in that earlier photograph. By this time, the Grand Ole Opry that had been broadcasting in the Ryman Auditorium from 1943 to 1974 has moved out to the east side of Nashville, closer to the airport, to the Opryland Hotel, and that's where they perform on that fabulous new stage. Um, that left the Ryman Auditorium empty for 20 years. They still owned it, they still protected it, but really it was a backdrop for photo shoots um, and that was about it. And in 1992, the whole city embarked on this as part of um, a larger national camp, um, effort to revitalize downtown, uh, the downtowns of mid-sized American cities and Nashville was one of those cities. They thought about knocking the Ryman down and building like a visitor outdoor park type thing that might have had shopping and a path to the river or something like that. But the country music industry just rallied and they saved the Ryman Auditorium. Also in 1992, Hatch Show Print, after 100 years of ownership by somebody from the Hatch family, first Charles and Herbert, then Will T, and then after Will T passed away in 1952, his uh, wife, and son took over and ran and managed the shop for a number of years, 12 or 15 years, something like that. Went through a series of private owners. Um, Hatch Show Print was actually owned by the same folks who owned 
the Grand Ole Opry and the Ryman Auditorium for about six years. They thought it was a great complement to the live entertainment aspect and the hotel hospitality businesses that they were interested in. They had a, a um, the Opryland theme park, I think, out there where there were rides and things and they set up a miniature print shop there, but it just wasn't a great fit. So then 1992, they donated Hat Show Print to the Country Music Foundation, which is the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. The same year as part of this downtown revitalization, like literally within months of the museum taking on Hatch and its entire collection, all of its type, all of its presses, all of those great blocks, they were evicted because part of the revitalization of downtown was to bring a great, a big new business to Nashville to establish its world headquarters here. That was AT&T. They built their building right where the print shop was, right across the street from the Ramen Auditorium. So we had to move um, within three months. So Jim and staff at the museum found this. There was this one or two buildings downtown. They found this building. It had originally been a furniture store. It has a beautiful wood floor. They had to reinforce the back of it. It's very narrow and deep, as you can see here, not quite set up to be a print shop, but um, they made it work. And this is where many, many folks have visited us from 1992 to 2013. And you can see some of the blocks, big blocks on the left there. There's a press right in the middle. Um, Jim is also the person who realized that Vander Cooks, he didn't have to turn on the big old poster printing presses that the shop was using. You, he could print posters on a Vander Cook, which was technically a proofing press at that point in time, but um, made a great difference in terms of him being able to print just 25 posters at a time. Um, you can see samples of the printing in the front. Um, 1994, um, in 1992, as I said, they were decided to re renovate the Ryman Auditorium and open it again as a venue. And so 1994, was when they finished it, Always Patsy Cline, the musical production was the first show that performed in there. And when they first started, they thought it was just going to be a venue that showed these sort of long run musical productions. What they didn't realize was that the um, the reputation of the Ryman, the acoustics of the Ryman, it's a hallowed hall for musicians and it's a rite of passage to play the Ryman Auditorium. If you ever have an opportunity to see one of your favorite bands, I highly recommend coming from Atlanta. I know you guys have a lot of great stuff, venues in Atlanta, but coming from Atlanta to hear them because it's incredible and it's one of the most intimate performance experiences you'll have for such a venue. Um, anyway, so they quickly transitioned from doing long run shows to doing nightly shows, as you can see. But um, at this point in time, in the dawn of the digital age of music, unfortunately, what that meant for musicians and songwriters and all of the folks who are involved in the recording and all of that, who would normally get paid some nice royalties from the record sales, um, started losing money. So in the digital era, I'm sure you guys have heard the joke that, you know, for a, a musician of such, even of such stature as um, Crosby, Stills and Nash, for them to get one penny from one of their songs from being played on Spotify and stuff like that, they have to play, it has to be, the song has to be played 5,000 times or something crazy like that. So Musicians, artists are not making as much money from their music, even starting in the late 90s or into the early 2000s. So touring, live entertainment is picking up as an option. And Jim is primed to be in the right spot, working with these posters, learning the business from these master printers like Kenneth Henson, who can show him all the technical aspects of letterpress printing. But give him room for Jim to inject the color of his printmaking background and the color that he knows these posters can have. And so you can see some examples of early stuff we did there. These are all posters for the Ryman Auditorium. I think they're all might all be from the year 2012, just to give you an idea and the variety 
and the, the techniques that are being used. And that is what Jim brought is that era of opening that door to not just um, a very, you know, strict approach to poster design or to printing or things like that as to all these colors. And so on this, you've got the Mo poster is actually vintage blocks. That was a Halloween show at the Ryman Auditorium. Um, the Feist poster on the lower right, that's a carved in a material that's called Sintra, which is a sort of plastic material. It's often used for exhibit signage or other signage. It has varying densities, but if you have a ballpoint pen, you can actually make a mark in it and that will show up when you print to uh, linoleum for that Shins poster for the monsters to uh, Ian Anderson. Um, the dark rectangle is a piece of upside down type and the text, quote unquote text of the thick as a brick one and two article of that newspaper is actually cardboard, corrugated cardboard that has been mounted type high and printed, made through the press. The explosions in the sky poster is a combination of a pressure print to create that nice little scalloping of the uh, water at the top to upside down type to create those textures for the red, the white, and the blue. Um, Grace Potter, there's some weird line action happening on the back of that background block, that color. Um, with letterpress printing, again, it's sort of one color at a time, one piece of paper at a time, unless you're doing a split fountain like uh, Heather did with that. But what she also did was she put packing tape, clear packing tape on the block to create that weird lightning bolty electric kind of um, void where the ink couldn't get to the block. And so it created that nice abstract background. So this is what we're doing starting in the mid to late 90s to the early 2000s. And these posters have become something that are not telling you or selling you. They're commemorative. Ringo Starr doesn't, doesn't he's got he spans the era of, of music. He is touring because he enjoys it, the experience. He, he's touring because he enjoys engaging with the fans. He tours because he likes to play music live. Um, and it helps that he gets paid a nice wage. He's not, not, you know, super concerned about whether or not he has a poster necessarily. Um, and it doesn't matter that when it is or where it is specifically because we all know when he's playing and where he's playing and have already bought our tickets online months ago. Um, so that information doesn't necessarily need to be, um, you know, top of mind or on the top of the poster the way they used to be. Now it's just all about celebrating Ringo Starr being live. Um, and this was in uh, North Carolina and Paul McCartney's first ever Nashville performance in 2010. That was the first time a Beatle came to Nashville in the history of the Beatles. So it's commemorative. It's something that gets sold at the merch table or is give out, given out to the crew of the, at the venue and the artist as a thank you for coming. Um, and it's commemorative. Um, While we're, while, while we're making those show posters, we're also restriking some of these gorgeous blocks that we have. Um, we have a series of blocks for um, recreational vehicles, as they're called, Landola, Ritzcraft, Airstream. And here you see a bunch of prints drying that Jim had printed. And then underneath all that super colorful stuff, you see where Jim is transitioning, looking at the blocks through the historical lens through the lens of, of being a printmaker and a printer, but as an artist as well, and working with them and layering them and hand inking on the paper, hand brayering on the paper, um, and creating work that is um, radically different from what any printer would have ever imagined for any of those blocks to ever had show print, which is super great. But meanwhile, the shop is getting busy, 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 busy. And this is, you know, probably 2012 when that photograph was taken. There's some more of his work with a beautiful wall of type. That's type on the left. Those big blocks on the right are some of the one sheets that we print. Um, so we're getting full. And this is when phase two of 
Nashville's revitalization comes to fruition. The Country Music Hall of Fame expands, covers this city block, connects its building with the Omni Hotel, which is brand new to Nashville because it's supporting our brand new convention center that is right across the street from these doors. Um, and we moved into this and here's the shop that I showed you earlier. There's our gift shop, chocolate block. This is our process, tools of our trade. Um, we are not sponsored by Coca-Cola, but some of the staff are fueled by Coca-Cola. Um, but you can see we're in the upper right corner, we start with sketches and notes, or uh, sorry, upper left corner. And then we go to working with what we have in the collection, setting the type to once it's approved, mixing the ink, getting on press, getting messy, cleaning up and the great variety of work that we do. Um, hand carving again, linoleum. The crazy fairy with the little girl is a block. It's a metal printing plate we have here in the shop and we have no idea what it was for, um, but the Black Keys liked it. And so we put it on their poster in 2019. Um, for Dolly Parton's 50 years on the Grand Ole Opry, we, re we carved the, the burst of roses, if you will, that's behind her name, um, just for her, but we get to reuse it. That's the beauty. You know, a couple of things here, the designer is the printer, the printer is the designer. That's the only way it works. Um, and preservation through production, by carving blocks, we're preserving that knowledge, making these posters, we're getting this type of work out into people's hands and uh, people can see it and hopefully are curious about it and come and visit us or ask us about it. Um, and we're, you know, preserve, literally preserving the type, the wood type by using it, because if we didn't use it, it would just dry rot away here in this, in this old print job. Um, when we moved, we found a bunch of blocks that we didn't know we had kind of, so we've been reprinting those. And you can see on the right, the follow the crowd where everybody goes. That was probably carved in the late 1800s, early 1900s. The follow the crowd on the left was carved post Cooper Black. So that would have been in Will T. Hatch's era. So just some differences in the styles of uh, lettering and, and communication. It's kind of fun for us to see as part of our history. More great posters. Some of our great interns, because we do have an internship program and notice they're all wearing Hawaiian shirts. It's part of our, one of our traditions here. In 2015, we celebrated uh, Jim's 33 plus years with the shop. Um, and then he went on to make, and is now making incredible artwork that comes from his printmaking background, but goes out into working with the paper and watercolor and chopping it all up and reimagining it through different lenses, whether it's a crazy quilt pattern here or more specific patterns with some of his other work that he's been doing recently. Um, I suggest checking him out. Um, we, we have visiting artist programs. This is David Wolski. He's working with that two sheet type, you can see. Judith Poyer, who is a um, graphic design and type, type design instructor at the University of Quebec in Montreal, but is also an experimental filmmaker. We had her as a visiting artist. Wayne White, some of you may know, was a visiting artist in 2018. Carlos Hernandez was an outlaw printmaker and a if you guys know what that is, and uh, is a visiting art was a visiting artist in 2019, and we did some crazy stuff with collage, and he carved like more blocks than you would imagine in two weeks. Um, we had a bunch of students in, and we did some exercises in just getting the color and imagery out on the paper because Carlos carries a sketchbook around with him, and he says, "Draw every day, just sketch every day. It doesn't have to be great. Just keep your brain going." and I'm going super fast here. There's uh, Nick and Heather um, who still who work here 
um, that are actually printing one poster. Nick's printing the first color, Heather's printing the second color because sometimes the deadlines just sneak up on you. We don't always use fancy things to print with. On the left, you see that's $2.68 worth of pennies. And on the right there, you've got some emoji stickers that are like kind of this squishy foam stuff. We make mistakes. Bill Minore is not an artist we've met yet. Um, here's some more examples of great posters. There's some pressure printing on the, happening on a common poster, and I'll show you that in a second, how that works. Um, there's a newspaper center spread that we did in 2019, celebrating the class of 1989, a cool Mavericks poster for their 30th year making music. There is <laughs> Devin 3D printing, ha, ah, not really, but it looks really cool through glasses. And then that's the uh, background with the paper on the packing of the presses ripped out to create that, those voids of ink for a common in August 22nd. Celebrity visitor to the shop, we get them all the time. Some more colorful posters. <laughs> thematic and colors continuing you re again re reusing we're reusing that block that was probably for advertising candy in the mid 20th century to mo in 2012 to just a happy halloween poster multiple posters for jason isbell carved out of linoleum so that we it could withstand the printing the print shop again that beautiful inky press Oh gosh, more posters. We'll go with wood type and then linoleum and a bit of pressure printing happening to get that trapping to look really nice on those vines as they wind their way through the leather. Sintra and pressure printing. Working with graphic design students here in Nashville from Watkins um college of art and design and creating posters that are thematic and trying to teach them all about uh letterpress printing not the specifics of letterpress printing but more the physicality of the design we use um, and then this is more of our programming with the community getting ink on paper and fabric with uh, block printing working with students using abstract forms that can create letters. It's called alpha blocks. Making a bunch of posters for the 2019 draft pick here in Nashville, one for each team. Going full size to create murals. So that's our um, mural artist, Brian Deese, who we work with here in Nashville and he took our uh, layout that we used everything life size. So that's our one sheet type. And there's our big woman, one of our other big type. And he translated it into a mural for us for our 140th birthday in 2019. Um, oh yeah, there's the collaboration with Draper James. Um, again, it, they all started as letterpress prints, but then were translated into t-shirts, sweatshirts, the back of that jean jacket. Um, and tote bags. And then a, we did actually made our own book, actually, when we turned 140. Um, and so we got to create some chapter openers using our stuff here in the shop. Printing on the street, something we hadn't tried before. So we tried that in 2019 with a steamroller. I highly recommend it. I also highly recommend hot dogs or tofu dogs if you don't eat meat. Um, <laughs> here we are. Um, and that's all I got for, for my presentation. I know I went well over uh, the time limit, but I just wanted to talk about, we, we reverence the history of the shop and we use it, but we also are, feel our responsibility is to carry it forward and to find new ways to do, get the ink on the paper. And, and that's part of what we enjoy here. And 
part of the conversation we enjoy having within the design community and the printmaking community because um, we love seeing what other people are doing in their media of choice or medium of choice and reacting to that and translating our clients uh, dreams and wishes and aesthetics into something that comes out of this shop. So thanks for uh, hanging in there with me. Lee, that was an amazing trip through history for sure. And the cultural associations that are so deep. And, and, and I wondered how many students picked up on some of the technical terms of trapping and uh, things like that, which are um, found right on InDesign today, but I doubt many of these guys know about it. And uh, so um, it's great to hear you talk about that and introduce some of that, the cultural context, the history of really of, of, of the whole century and uh, that's born in there and how you mixed it with the timeline, uh, amazing. We can open it up for a few questions if you guys would like to, uh, to um, shoot a couple questions. I, I will tell you, it's amazing trip to take and see it in the real um, when, when it's over. Yeah, and, when, and if you guys ever decide to do field trips, um, back when the universe or when the universe opens up again let us know and we can we can you know do a special chat just for you and show you some special stuff behind the scenes um, but yeah i'm happy to answer any questions i know i went long and so thanks for hanging in there with me um, i'm happy to walk around the shop and share more stuff if you want to do that doesn't matter to me just let me know I don't know if the microphones are open or not. Uh, Sometimes that's the moderator thing. Maybe. Uh, Kristen, are you here? Uh, access. Um, yes, I'm here, but the, the mics are okay. Oh, great. No, he, uh, Ralph does not. Kristen? Hold on one moment. Let me check into that. Okay. Hold on for an IT minute. Someone mentioned that it's not allowing them to participate when they try to unmute. Okay, try it again. Hi. Okay. Now it's working. Um, I just have a quick question. Also, I just want to say thank you as someone who has a background in printing and I've worked at a small commercial printer in East Nashville and I've been to the exhibit. Um, I just want to know what you think makes Hatch so foolproof. Like the printing industry has had a lot of up, ups and downs, especially in the digital age. What do you think made Hatch like stand the test of time for so long? Um. I think a location, 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 location. So as I mentioned earlier, because the music industry is here in Nashville um, and it, it does extend beyond, thankfully beyond, I love country music, but I also love the variety of music and Nashville has always fostered that, which is great. And so being here and being part of that, we're sort of, you know, we're part of the accessorization of that industry, like Manuel or nudie suits, if you're gonna get the fringe suits for wearing on stage. But if you're gonna advertise, historically, we were the shop for the show posters, which is great. As on top of that, I think, but what I, would I, in the 21st century, what I relate it to is the bounce back to everybody's interest in vinyl and collecting vinyl. And I think the more digital we go, the farther away everything gets from us. Like we can't interact with the music aside from listening to it. And I think we miss that because as humans, we're kind of hardwired for tactile experiences and physical engagement with the process. Like why a lot of people enjoy cooking is because you get to physically engage with your food, chopping it up, sauteing it before you eat it. Um, when the entertainment 
buying your ticket becomes digital. You don't, you don't even hardly sometimes don't even get a receipt, you know, even in the email. Um, so you don't necessarily get a printed ticket anymore. And all of those things we're we are to some degree or another, every one of us likes physical things. And I think like that swing back to vinyl, a poster from the shop is a tactile reminder of an experience that is fleeting and a, as more ephemeral than the paper. It's a live music or live entertainment experience. And quite frankly, because we know how to mix all the colors and we know how to make a poster speak um, Jason Isbell's visual language or Common's visual language or Jay-Z and Beyonce's visual language, which means at the end of the day for us that it's gonna to speak to their fans or to the people who appreciate their music. I think that's very hard to find, to find one place that can do that broad of range and does it consistently. We are fortunate, we have 142 years of portfolio work that's kind of out there in the world. So our reputation has sort of speaks for itself in that regard. And all we need to do is keep living up to that and keep pushing forward, keep finding the ways to bring people in as we tell their stories through the work that we do. If, does that, if that makes sense. Like, no, yeah, for sure. For, for us, like, at least for me personally, as a designer, um, because everything we do is a celebration of something or a special event of some sort, it's a, it should be a pretty positive experience. And so um, the fact that we're working with someone who's also working towards this culminating event, be it a show, a conference, a trade show, you know, a 50th anniversary of a business, a 100th anniversary of a business, which we've done recently. Um, our goal is to help them tell their story through our medium. And that's a celebratory experience. And we're, if we, it's just, you know, if we don't make them look good, if we don't make them happy with how their story is told, um, then nobody is, is having a good time, <laughs> quite frankly. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> so that's the way I look at it. Also, just like what Hank said, all of this, and if any of you guys work in print, you know, in media that's going to last longer than website design or something like that. I mean, personally, of course, I'm biased towards it. I appreciate the beauty of it, the ephemeral of the digital. I do definitely appreciate that. Um, but if you're working in anything that becomes something tangible, you are becoming part of the history of humankind. Even if it's something as small as a business card, it's contributing to that conversation. And so that's what we, that's fascinating and fun and interesting because some of these things that this shop made don't exist anymore. You know, we we have we have rotary dial telephones. And little kids come into the shop and there's one at the front of the shop and they're like, what is that? And you're like, ah, yeah. it's, a telephone. it's a telephone. Um, you know, and it's it's great to, to sort of span that breadth and um, re have a daily physical reminders that we're all here and we all can have an impact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it was amazing seeing all the work. I hope to be in Nashville soon. My sister lives up there. So uh Fingers crossed, I'll be able to come visit. Yeah. Elaine, that's a, that's a really good point about the tactile experience of music. In my day, it was called an album cover, and you <laughs> used, used to have it in your hands while you were listening. Um, hey, I'm curious about the business model, because you're do you really think of yourself as a commercial printer or more of a, uh, you mentioned the commem commemorative posters. Uh, are you more of a fine art uh, kind of shop? And a technical question, a lot of your designs had gradations in them, the uh, black keys, and it didn't look like it was screened. Is that the ink application or how do you get that? Yeah. And then one last one is you mentioned like the photo plates 
and putting cardboard on there. Has anybody taken, say, the photography? It seems like it's a, such an extreme from the, the beautiful design. Has anybody like screened a photo, but used either a milling machine for to subtract or like a 3D printing and build a plate and then include that in the, uh, the letterpress? Okay, going backwards from the most recent one. Um, we still use, we just printed a poster for Carly Pierce, who was inducted into the Grand Ole Opry um, last weekend. We still use metal photo plates and we still get those from a plate maker now in Michigan. Um, we used to have a plate maker around the corner up until about 2014 and then he went out of business. Um, the reason why we use that, use photo plates is A, they can withstand the process. So the, the, the shall we say the easiest presses to use are exerting 100, 300, up to at least 300 pounds of pressure on the type and on those photo plates. Um, 3D printing hasn't developed a material that I'm sure will hold up to that process faithfully like it'll start to spread and squidge. It's, you know, highly technical term guys, squidge. It means that, that the image will get everything. Like if you if you were printing a dot, series of dots, all the dots would get fatter um, because the pressure of the press. And that's, the, that's one of our lighter presses. So I'm not sure that 3D printing materials have come up to that. We're, from the technology standpoint, we're not an experts in the technology of stuff like that. We never made photo plates here in the shop. We never do the acid bath. We leave all of that technology to outside entities. If someone were to approach us with some, some aspect of that technology that says, yeah, that's, that's going to be great, we'll do it, we'll use it. That issue aside, we do experiment with laser cutting and CNC routing in wood and mainly more of the graphic elements. Um, we haven't done type. Our type collection spans the history of the shop's uh, time frame of procuring type from the original type foundries. And so we're, we tend not to want to dilute that aesthetic and or type typographical library, if you will. It has worked for 140 years. We're not gonna inject a new typeface design to that now because there's quite frankly, no reason to do that. And then I think that goes back to uh, the first question, which is how do we maintain ourselves as a business? We are commercial. We're designing, sometimes, I mean, I you know designed a poster this morning. I got the approval on it. I'm gonna start printing it probably tomorrow or the next day and it's going to go out to do out the door to this cus to the client and he's going to keep it and maybe some of the other people who attend this commemorative or this annual event are going to keep it but the rest of the posters i don't know where they're going to wind up they're going to probably wind up being recycled or in the bottom of somebody's hamster cage or something like that and we know that and we accept that in what we do we don't uh, look at it as too precious. And we also, everybody who works here makes own, their own work on their own time with their own aesthetic. When you're, I think for us, because we're working with a client and it's very much a, a conversation and we do have to have approval and we do sometimes have to go back to the drawing board and start over. It's really hard for me to see how that could be considered art. I understand that the craft is, the, the level of craft is, is high and I appreciate that people think that of us, but for us, our goal is to satisfy a client's wishes and demands. And so at the end of the day, that alters the focus of the work. Um, and then the middle question, they're called split fountains, the, the gradations, they're, we call them split fountains. Um, sometimes they're 
that like that black keys poster it was darker pink and then fading into almost white or very 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 pale pink in the middle um, sometimes it's red yellow Corey this morning just printed a split fountain of the full rainbow on the press and we do that here in the shop we do it on the printing press we do it with the with the ink um, it's part of our process nothing is ever screen printed here it's all letterpress printed i know of some great, you know, I think of um, Jay Ryan in Chicago, um, who does some incredible split fountain work with, but he's a screen printer. Um, but split fountains are just a, you know, if you're putting some substance on the paper that is colored, you probably can figure out a way to do a split fountain. And it's part of what we do here. It's historically part of what the shop did. Uh, it just depends on how you orient the paper in the press. We have bigger presses so you can turn the paper from this way to this way. And so the ink's running this way and crosses the paper. Um, and that's, that's how it works. It's just the subtlety of it. And the beautiful thing about the electrification of printing presses is that it's purely on some level, purely for very even thin distribution of ink. So the press is working in your favor there, really doing a great job of blending that ink and bringing it all together and creating that um, split fountain. So you just have to make sure you don't accidentally, you know, hit that white with a dot of black or something crazy like that, and then you're good to go. <laughs> uh, let's see, there's a question here from Maggie. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. My pleasure, thanks for listening. Uh, you spoke about creating a narrative for your clients. What are the cues to selecting the correct typography to evoke the narrative and tell a story? Um, that's great. Um, that's actually, okay, here's a timely, timely response to that. Uh, I have the great um, fortune, that five day turnaround poster we had, one of them, we had a couple weeks ago, was to celebrate the fact that uh, our street in front of our shop is now John Lewis Way. And he, they were having an event on the anniversary of his death to officially, you know, mark the street. He went to school here in Nashville, protested here in Nashville at the Woolworths, which happens to be further up the street from us. And they marched from Woolworths to downtown Martin Luther King uh, Jr. also spoke here in Nashville as well. So they protested here. I got to do the poster for that event honoring John Lewis on the anniversary of his death at the street. He's from the era, the mid 60s of protest posters, the I Am A Man poster, if you're familiar with that, um, from the Memphis garbage union marches that they had in the 60s, I think 68, something like that. Um, maybe 63, sorry, 63. Um, anyway, very simple, all sans serif, clarity of communication, telling you the message. The message is the medium. The message is the medium for somebody like John Lewis. And so the poster is all sans serif type, it's two colors because that's what they ordered and asked for. This would have been, yep, yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Marshall McLuhan, the message is the medium. So for something like this, it made sense to use all Gothic type because this is reflective of the period of the posters of the era. And if you read it top to bottom and just read one color, Nashville, Tennessee, now honoring John Lewis and the date, which is the anniversary of his death. That was the purpose. At a distance, you'll see that. Up close, you'll see that Fifth Avenue is now representative John Lewis Way. Who the heck is John Lewis? Freedom writer, civil rights leader, one of your congressmen. And then a quote from him at the bottom in red, which is set in italics, which sets it off again from the rest of this. And that's because it's a quote. So it's it's using from the typography standpoint, 
depends on the theme of the poster. If you're doing a spooky poster, we have this crazy type that's got spikes on it. And so you might choose that. Um, for a poster with, that you want the message to be very clear, Santera. I will also say in the 21st century, you guys are probably familiar with this, super condensed or light faces of sans serif type is very, very um, popular right now, shall we say. So we, we, we can use, we use a lot of that on contemporary posters. I'm thinking for instance of the Jay-Z and Beyonce poster, it was sans serif type, very big, very light. Um, if it's a circus poster, we're gonna use fun, silly type, you know, and we have a little bit of that here in the shop. So that's kind of where, where we think. And we also think about the type of poster. This was, as I said, a commemorative poster for the anniversary of his passing, um, honoring him with a street name, honoring his work. And so kind of a sober poster, not doesn't need a lot of bells and whistles. A poster for a country music artist might need some stars. And if he's, if he's a country music artist or she's a country music artist, they might like music notes. Um, when we do posters for somebody like Brad Paisley, he is a left-handed guitar player. So we have to carve a left-handed guitar because it's, that makes sense to him. And he's known for his guitars. We've done a bunch of posters in the last year and a half for Joe Bonamassa, and he is uh, a blues guitarist, and he has an incredible collection of guitars. And so we include a guitar on every one of his posters as part of his design, because that's what he's known for by his fans. And that's what they love is that when they go to his shows, he's got a rack of guitars of like 12 or 15 guitars and he'll pick them up and play different guitars through the whole show. So that's, that's and then color, color, I mean, color, you can't, you can't underestimate the power of color. Uh, two things I say to myself and sometimes to anybody who will listen, if your design doesn't look good in black and white or shades of gray and white, you might wanna rethink it because it needs to communicate what your goal is without any additional color. But once you've gotten to that point, the color, what the colors are that you're using will change, can change the mood of the poster and the vibe of the poster um, immeasurably. And so we are always thinking about color here in the shop. I hope that helped, Maggie. <laughs> that was definitely very helpful. And the type hi uh, hierarchy on that poster is absolutely beautiful as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, um, and again, for me, like, it's an honor for me to be able to make this poster. And that's, you know, you, you have to sometimes even in the, the jobs, you don't necessarily know why you're doing it or what it's for. Sometimes you've got to find that tiny bit of grace that will help you um, find the, an elegance to the solution, if you will. <laughs> Very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Salini, this has been great today. You know, you've just taken so much time with these guys and truly appreciate it. I mean, this is the kind of a presentation that, that, that they will really digest for years to come. And I really hope if you guys get to Nashville, you go by go by the shop and see what, see, even in this presentation, it's hard to explain how cool that shop is. And um, they also yeah. have, have those posters are for sale. Um, you can't see <laughs> my house, but I have posters around for sure. And, um, and, um, and, and, and I have one of Jim's posters that uh, Mule Skinner Blues and uh, uh, that where he deviated a little bit from to make his own poster. Um, yeah. But I remember um, that one of the jobs that an intern gets there is learning how to straighten up all the type on the shelves when they get there. And, uh, and sometimes they, uh, they learn, they have to learn the hard way. So, but you will learn things at 
if you're there, like things like, there've been a number of technical terms that have been tossed about. And I, I kind of sit here and wonder if you really understand those. And um, they're all available in, in digital format for sure. Um, but just knowing them in the sense of production, it was kind of a question. And, and I'll try and put something out about some of them, but that was pretty amazing um, because there are things you will need to know um, going forward. And, um, and like Jamie, you worked at a printing company, so you probably have a, you know, a step above, but when you work at, in letterpress, um, you can't, everything is physical. And that is a huge difference that when you start working with type that is physical, you will yeah. brush yourself a little bit and you will like have so much fun to experiment and put your fingers. Yeah, you, you're, um, we make posters here. And so our, I equate, sometimes equate this to and I'm going to speak in generalizations. I'm not speaking about any of you specifically and what your design proclivities might be when you get into the digital world. Um, but for us here in the shop, we have we know what our finished product is. We know the proportions. We know pretty much what we're going to need to be producing. So we start there. We don't ever start, you know, in terms of what the proportions are. We don't ever start with some little corner and sketch the hell out of one little corner and then say, we'll figure out the rest layer later. It's a holistic thing because the design is more than one little bit of something. It's the whole presentation, whatever your format is. So, um, you know, I recommend you think about it that way. We can't, we can't just like make our type magically grow or shrink like this, it always goes in steps and the steps are um, one third of an inch higher, taller with everything. So you can't, I mean, that's, you know, we've, <laughs> I won't say who, but we had one client tell us to shrink the music notes on a poster by 10% and then good to print. Um, I will tell you, we didn't shrink those music notes by 10% because we can't do that. We don't, that's not how our, when you're working with physical, uh, physically cut blocks, that's not how that works for us. And when you're working with physical type, as I mentioned, sort of at the very beginning, our letter spacing and our line spacing and our kerning no. is all metal and wood and you can't mash two things together like a T and an A if they haven't if they're not meant to go together. And so that's why I'm sure if you look at vintage newspapers and things like that, you look at a headline and there's some weird spacing, they weren't worried about that. You know, They were worried about getting whatever the headline is to be eye-catching with the words and getting, making sure all of the, the letters fit on there, but how spaced out it is, they're less concerned with that. And so, um, that's a that's a refinement we don't necessarily have here at the shop. So we do it other ways. But yeah, rules like deadlines, there are deadlines on printing press. You can only print within the deadlines. If you try to print at the top or the bottom, you will you could crush your type or your hand carved blocks. And so as I used to tell the students that I taught when I was in Chicago, I said, if it's not if you're not printing within the deadlines, you're not going to print. It's not, if you're not, you know, if you don't meet your deadline, you're not going to print. So, and that goes back to the newspaper business and not making your deadline. It doesn't go to print. Um, letter spacing, current, all of that stuff, everything. Yeah. Lines, the body weights. Yeah. I mean, we could talk about that forever, Hank. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming today and sharing your, your knowledge with the young folks. And they're going to be able to digest this for a long time. So really, really do appreciate it. Oh, and, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And yeah. thank all you guys for coming and for the broadcast. And, uh, and, and I guess we'll see everybody next week. This has been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh,